So advertisers have said this year they are taking back control yeah. of media. So in this episode, we're going to explore what might they mean by that, mm -hmm. and also how do they go about doing it. Uh, Control has been a consistent narrative. At the beginning of this year, you might recall from uh, one of our early episodes this year, we said that action would be our word of the year for media, uh, and it's looking like that's coming true. That's right. So we're 10 weeks into 2018, yeah. and you know, one thing is for certain is that marketeers have certainly actioned yeah. a lot more control over the way that they manage kind of media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, well, where I really noticed it uh, was a few weeks ago, I think I mentioned on last week's episode, I was at the ANA's media conference where, you know, most notably the headlines were, mm. were captured by Mark Pritchard from P&G, uh, who uh, laid out a, kind of an update of their action plan on media uh, and said, we're taking back control, we're putting our hands on the keyboard, we're going to build kind of greater in-house capabilities. And he talked about the reinvention and disruption of media and advertising. So that kind of set the standard as a keynote. Mm. But what was interesting is that he was not, he's not a lone voice. Yeah. There are more and more brands now kind of echoing or coming out with their own uh, version of this type of sentiment of taking control. At the ANA, we saw Johnson & Johnson, AB InBev, Ford, Nationwide, and others. Marketers kind of queuing up to share their experiences yeah. and their stories about how they're taking control and better decision making. That's right. And that theme, I think, continued during the Isbar conference uh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Uh, Barclays on the stage talking about kind of bringing back further control. We've had David Weldon, uh, CMO of RBS and president of the WFA, yeah. talk about his ambitions of bringing more control, more programmatic buying control yeah. in-house. Yeah. Um, and so I that think that's a point of clarification, which is why we want to make this episode really, is to, just to start to clarify what does control actually mean? Mm -hmm. And is it the same as in-housing? Does it mean in-housing? No. It doesn't. It means, it means marketers asserting greater leadership yeah. over media internally. And that can be leadership over the control of contracts, over the way that they remunerate their agencies, moving perhaps away from uh, cost KPIs and yeah. changing the narrative internally to more outcome-based mm -hmm. KPIs, um, looking at how to be smarter in analysing and using data yeah. to making smarter, more informed media decisions. Yeah, indeed. Good. So uh, we thought we'd share with you what we call the five states <clears throat> of media control. Uh, and what this illustrates are the different levels of control that advertisers are taking over media decision making. Uh, and we'll break each one down in turn. Right. So the five states of media control. Yep. Uh, so when we talk about this, we would, would draw a bell curve and we can segment out advertisers into these five progressive states. Yeah. Um, and we're going to look at each of these in turn. So we, the first is pre-consolidation. And so what we mean by that, these are advertisers who have not yet aggregated all their media spend, all their media budgets, mm -hmm. into a small number of agencies. Yeah. So they may be quite decentralized and working with lots of different agencies. Right. The next stage is, is consolidation. And then that's followed by what we call post-consolidation, fragmentation of scope, and then finally, the full in-housing of media operations. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's start with the, with the pre-consolidation. What do we mean by that? So this is where advertisers exhibit probably the least amount of control yeah. over media governance, where they have empowered and kind of relinquished control and decision-making almost entirely to their agency partners. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's still probably a large group, but that used to be the way that That's it right. was done. You know, that, that, that uh, advertisers would work with the agencies that they wanted to, and these were in the, in the days before the aggregation of, of yeah. billings, before the big consolidation of big kind of media network mm. holding companies. Um, that's how it was. Yeah. But there are still a lot of advertisers that operate in that way. That's right. Okay, the next stage is consolidation. So that's advertisers concentrating spend into fewer agencies. That's right. And, and they do that because they're looking to benefit from the aggregated billings yeah. of the big kind of holding groups. Now, this illustrates a sense of control on mm -hmm. behalf of the marketeer, but it is control on the costing and really only the costing, sometimes driven by uh, a heavy procurement kind of focus yep. uh, where their core KPIs are all about savings and discounts. Yeah. And so we see we'll, in that example, we'll see pressures on media pricing yeah. and also agency fees. Uh, anyway, in some places that's become a bit of a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. We've seen advertisers imposing kind of reverse auctions uh, in that consolidation stage. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, the 
big consolidations that were happening in 2015, became known as Media Palooza. Lots of the media pitches yeah. were, were of this type, consolidating to find savings. That's right. Okay, so next is post-consolidation. What do yes. we mean by that? And this is where we see the majority, I think, of advertisers moving to. This is about changing the narrative internally away yeah. from cost yeah. to more of a value discussion. Yeah. And this is about finding control over both the efficiency side of it, but importantly, the effectiveness side yes, of it. Yes, exactly. Uh, and this becomes, this is the change of narrative, yeah. right? Which is, becomes the race to the top. Once you've consolidated your media buying into, let's say, one or two agencies, you can't push effectiveness, you can't push efficiency necessarily any further That's than right. that. You can't, there's no further consolidation. And so then over the last couple of years, we've seen more and more uh, advertisers and particularly marketers really starting to take back control of, of media, seeing media as, a, as an investment in growth, holding media to higher standard KPIs, like you said at the beginning, um, and it's changing the relationship with their agencies often for the better, because right. they're willing to pay for planning. They're willing to pay for insight and quality. Yeah. Uh, and it changes much more to a race to the top, whereas previously it might have been a race to the bottom. And you mentioned Media Palooza in, in the previous uh, section. Yeah. Uh, the pitches this year are about finding that equilibrium. Yeah. So I think that's, right. that's, that's a reflection of the way that the market is moving. So the majority of the pitches that are going on at the moment yeah. are going to be about trying to find that, that equilibrium. Yeah, I agree. Right, so the next state is a fragmentation of scope. Yeah, now this is really interesting because you're moving away from consolidation yeah. back to fragmenting kind of partners, yeah. media partners. Now, the, the advertisers that exhibit you know, this type of behavior are the ones that understand the media management process, yeah. okay? And they're able to fragment those disciplines and go to market looking for best-in-class suppliers mm -hmm. in each of them. Yeah. Now, they exhibit control because somebody has to manage this new operating model, yeah. and, and that's quite a challenge. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so, but we're seeing more of this, so a, a lot of the uh, what well, more progressive advertisers, a lot of the, the kind of brands that we talked about at the beginning that are standing on stage right now talking about how they're taking back control, they are in this stage. Yeah. They are thinking about fragmenting out their agency, their consolidated agency scope, thin slicing it and figuring out which bits long term they're going to take control. It's not for everybody just yet, but what, we, what we're seeing is marketers are conducting, they start the process by conducting diagnostics. Yeah to understand where their internal strengths and weaknesses or gaps are, um, where they need to invest to improve, to enable them to start taking some control. Uh, and this has been the theme of all of these conference platforms recently. Yeah. Right, so the final state, in-housing. So there's lots of discussion about that. What do we mean? Right, there are broadly two types of advertisers yeah. that operate uh, in-housing solutions. The first are performance digital businesses generally that yeah. have organically grown their own marketing organizations to provide content and begin to implement media. And they act like an agency. That's right. Yeah. Uh, these are new businesses. And yeah. then there are those businesses that have evolved their own capabilities internally mm -hmm to perhaps be even more progressive within the marketplace, generally around programmatic, analytics, and even strategy. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so those are the five states of media control. Um, this year, we're seeing more and more marketers take action, take control, um, and you'll be able to see how they perhaps evolve across those five states across this year and the coming years. Okay, good week four. Television. Yeah. So uh, this is on the back of uh, some research that was commissioned by Radio Centre, mm -hmm. but delivered by Ubiquity. Yeah. Okay, and they were looking to measure the the power, the effectiveness of the different media in 2018, yeah. and they looked at perceptions both from an agency and advertiser perspective yeah. versus performance media. So the actual. The actual. So, so how powerful the marketeers believed a medium to be versus its actual delivery yeah. against ROI, saliency, various other targeting, yeah. various other key metrics. And TV won. Yeah. So a great performance for old school media. Good, good for that. And it's been a bad week for? It's been a bad week, there's a few, a few bad weeks, but what we've decided to talk about is it's been a bad week for YouTube. Uh, YouTube were called to go to meet the UK government. We have a thing called the Home Affairs Select Committee, which is a kind of committee of members of parliament 
uh, and they they can ask people to come and kind of explain themselves, grill them, um, and grill them. Uh, it's televised. It's recorded. We will link to it. You have to watch this. So this is the the topic was something really serious, which is about YouTube, YouTube's accountability and responsibility of managing extremist content, mm -hmm. and it was prompted. Uh, by an MP who's the chair of this committee called Yvette Cooper, who'd written a letter to Google to complain about one particular piece of content, uh, but with regard to lots of other things. Um, they were asked to come to the, to, to, uh, you know, answer to the committee, and the, the dialogue or the interactions that happened were shambolic. Yes. Um, now, you know, it's, it's sad to see uh, it was a really bad experience for the guy that came from YouTube. So his, his name was William McCants, and he's global policy lead for, for counterterrorism at YouTube. So you think he would be like the right person, mm. uh, but he came completely underprepared and underbriefed, which meant that, of course, the MPs uh, who spent an hour questioning him became increasingly frustrated and angry in some places with his lack of ability to answer their questions. We will link to it, you should watch it. It ends with some kind of choi quite choice quotes um, because he didn't know, he couldn't answer questions about who the people were that were screening content, where Google mm -hmm. keep claiming, you know, we're hiring thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. This was an opportunity for them to explain exactly how that works. He didn't know how it worked. He didn't know who was doing it. He didn't know where people were based. He didn't even know whether any of these people were actually employed by Google or part of an external company. He didn't know how they were being trained or what standards were being set. Even though having a week to prepare to answer the, the UK government, uh, the, 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 one of the ladies on the panel says, I feel insulted that, that YouTube have sent somebody who doesn't know the basic answers to the questions that we've asked you. Um, and it was an indication mm. in that they suggested that Google are not taking this seriously enough. Uh, it's kind of somewhat entertaining because it's cringeworthy, but it's such a serious topic, it requires better attention. Yeah. So uh, recommend that you watch it. Right, question of the week. So in the five states of media control, where are you? Pre-consolidation, consolidation, post-consolidation, post fragmentation, or in-house. <laughs> very good. Okay, excellent. Uh, please answer up there. That's your uh, media snack for this week. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week. Okay, so next, so post-consolidation, yes. what do we mean by that? So post-consolidation is about having... Oh, sorry. I wasn't quite ready for that. Okay. <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs>